Hi there, and welcome to the Inspired Living podcast with Ellen Broderick. Um, each week, we delve into a conversation with an individual who's found their passion and is pursuing it. This week, my guest is Marty Espinola. Marty is a retired administrator at the Gill Montague School District in Turner Falls, Massachusetts, where he was the director of learning, the director of grants and technology, and at times, the acting superintendent of schools. Uh, Marty has been the vice president of the Pioneer Valley Performing Arts Charter School, I believe until just the last couple of weeks or maybe a week or two. Um, Marty is a graduate of the California Institute for Integral Studies, and he also holds a degree in school administration from the University of Hartford. In the community, Marty is really active. He has been an active participant um, uh, in the um, Northampton Senior Center until the pandemic. Um, he is involved in two photography clubs, one the Valley Photography Adventurers and the other being our gang photography club. Um, until the pandemic, Marty also shot video for the Northampton Community TV and was a docent at the Smith College Botanical Center. And I, I really pared this down from all of the things that Marty has been in, involved with. So Marty, it is delightful to have you with us today. Thank you. And I thought maybe we could start today with, you've obviously been involved in, in, in a wide array of, um, of endeavors that both uh, help the community and also um, really attend to children. So perhaps you could start by talking about where the um, impetus comes from in you to be reaching out and um, and providing such a um, you know bringing your gifts and your skills to these groups. Let's start with the children. Well, um, I just um, always enjoyed uh, working with children, and um, when I. <clears throat> was in the seminary, I got a chance to teach a catechism class to some third graders. And I just found great joy in doing that and creating lessons that would be interesting as well as inspirational for the kids. And that led me to leave the seminary to become a teacher. Um, and uh, my favorite uh, students were the fifth graders because they they already had some basic skills and were ready to really move on and explore the world in much deeper ways and again i just really enjoyed uh, helping children first of all to enjoy learning and to have the opportunity to be co-creators in their learning experience so um, so it's a combination of just enjoying working with children and also my own desire uh, and joy at being able to do creative things uh, as far as education goes. Because uh, I, was, I was never a good student. I was very bored in school and didn't want to duplicate that <laughs> if I was going to be working with students. And, and what sorts of, of things did you, um, you know, sort of pull out of your sleeve so that the kids were engaged and, um, and, um, and excited about learning? Well, two things, really. One, I tried to connect them more with nature through our study of science. And we did a lot of different kinds of science projects uh, together. And... Um, the other thing was I really enjoyed teaching writing and uh, coming up with prompts or ideas for kids to write about that they would find exciting. Um, in fifth grade, you, you teach pretty much everything. And I, I've always enjoyed uh, that diversity of being able to move from one thing to another and keep the students engaged in, in different ways, whether it was history or science or geography or writing or reading or whatever. 
I mean, spelling was a tough one <laughs> to, to do much with, but um, we did play spelling games and things like that. So, yeah, so I, I just have a part of me that loves to do creative things and obviously to enjoy what I'm doing. And so, uh, yeah, so that's what I try to do with my students. And I try to do the same thing in my photography classes. And I tend to want to make my role as a teacher or a leader less and trying to, as much as I can, encourage and empower the the people in front of me, uh, young students or adults, to kind of take charge of their learning and to contribute uh, their own ideas to whatever we're learning. That's wonderful. Were you, um, am I recalling this correctly, that you had um, some uh, association or involvement with the responsive uh, classroom? Is that what it was called? In yeah, that was one of many programs that I, uh, supported in my school district. Um, the co-creator of that program was a good friend of mine and a co-worker. And um, so uh, I, I was fortunate in uh, being able to bring the, the concepts of the responsive classroom, which relates to what I've been talking about in the responsive classroom program, uh, students have a lot of say in what goes on in the classroom. If the teacher can structure that, you know, in, in a well-organized and appropriate way. So, um, and I, I was involved early in my career with uh, a program at UMass in humanistic education and um, enjoyed, for example, as one of the ways I would inspire kids with writing is to do guided imagery with them to get them started because a common comment with kids was I don't know what to write about. So that was a way of helping them. Um, so I, I mentioned that because um, the responsive classroom um, also engages students to talk about um, ideas and feelings in their morning meetings, and then to contribute ideas to how uh, things are run in the classroom, including how to create a set of rules for everybody to go by, uh, behavioral rules, as well as academic rules for the classroom. So again, that whole idea of co-creation, which I know you're into yourself, uh, um, it isn't just with the creator, I think it's with other people. Yeah, I remember with the responsive classroom also, there was a, an empowerment that the children could, with a little bit of guidance, really um, address the interpersonal issues that arose as well. And that right. always impressed me about that program. Yes. Yeah. And then Marty, uh, what, what was the transition like from then working with kids, which obviously you enjoyed doing and, and brought a lot to, to um, uh, the more administrative? And, and I, I realized too that even in the administrative work that you did with, um, with uh, school districts, there was a big um, emphasis on getting the funds that were needed for uh, continuing the arts programs, let's say, or deepening the, the arts programs um, and, and for other things that the school uh, might want to offer the kids. But can you speak to that? Well, I, I'm, I don't know how much to say. I mean, I found grants easy to write. I mean, there was no prompt. I didn't have to create much. I had to follow directions for the most part. Um, I shouldn't say that, that there was People don't give you money for the same old thing. You did have to create something different uh, in order to get the money. Nevertheless, um, I, I did enjoy the creative as that aspect of writing grants. I didn't so much enjoy all the hoops and things you had to jump through in terms of the bureaucracy of it. But um, yeah, and I it was very clear that a lot of the programs I was interested in starting or promoting or supporting 
required money. I mean, you have to be practical if you want it to um, get these interesting and exciting programs going in the schools. Mm -hmm. And what were some of those programs, um, Marty? Well, um, I the the first grant I got was to start a teacher center in the school where I worked, and then. Uh, Another one that came shortly after that, I got a grant for the high school physics teacher to, to purchase some very sophisticated equipment to be able to do demonstrations and experience uh, with, uh, mo um, say, movement, I guess, uh, some aspects of physics anyway. I wasn't all that clear about it, I, the teacher gave me the information that helped me write the grant. And that was the case for many, many of the grants. <clears throat> I took the, the grant and what whoever was offering the grant, they tell you what they're looking for usually. And <clears throat> so you take that and you go to people and you say, you know, what can you do in this? And um, that's a way of starting it. Other programs that I did start was the Community School Partnership was a, a program that brought together the various uh, organizations in the Gilmonic U and Greater Greenfield community that were serving the needs of students. And those groups had not communicated um, as they hadn't been brought together to coordinate. Uh, and so that program was another one that's actually still going on. And um, let's see, well, there were many grants for technology because of computers and technology so expensive. And um, so I got many grants to help buy computers and advanced calculators and things for the schools. And one of the grants that I'm very proud of is I got a grant of $630,000 when we renovated our middle school, high school. It enabled us to install um, a large solar panel array, as well as a great many uh, energy saving uh, aspects of, uh, in the school, you know, leave the room, the lights go off and the heat goes down and then it comes back up and all, oh, kinds of things that um, basically saved energy. Oh, and also um, we re it was a complete renovation of this large building and we were able to recycle um, a lot of the materials that we took from the building. Um, and to do that, I had to form a committee of people from the community and they were wonderful in terms of, again, co-creating with ideas and things that we could do in this new, or I should say renovated school building. And the building was basically gutted and rebuilt. So anyway, those are some of the things. I hope that answers your question. I can't remember everything. <laughs> Well, you know, what, what occurs to me, Marty, is that, um, that you um, are thinking always about what is, um, what is going to propel, uh, bring them the most um, benefit to the children. And you're thinking also then about the um, environment as you're doing this. And that, it seems to me, has the double benefit of um, uh, of uh, addressing the issues of environment and 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 bringing those into the school in a way that's very practical and immediate. Yes, that's it. it just is uh, exciting to me to be able to again bring exciting and inspiring ideas and programs um, to the groups that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about your own um, interests and, and the way you pursue them. And you're a, a exceptional photographer and you've had um, your work has been published in, in some of the, um, the is it bird and is it bird? Birds and Blooms. Birds and Blooms um, has, I, I know, had some wonderful photographs that you have taken uh, in there, but I've also seen 
um, more that you've you have had um, local shows in both the libraries and some of the community businesses. Um, uh, what got you interested in photography and um, and again, you know, in sharing what you know with others? Well, I, I'd say that the primary interest was avoiding boredom because when I was 13 years old, I was home one summer and really bored terribly. And somehow in putzing around the house, I found my mother's old Kodak camera. And I guess with nothing better to do, I thought, well, maybe I can learn how to use this and take some pictures. And, um, and I did that and they came out absolutely terrible and I couldn't understand why, but I wanted to. And that sort of motivated me to start figuring out how to uh, record images that touch my spirit. Um, and that's, yeah. So it, it's been pretty much uh, a serious hobby and sometime profession from time to time over the years. Um, but my love has always been nature photography. Um, I've never enjoyed wedding photography. Um, I did enjoy newspaper photography because it was kind of exciting to be out there with, you know, these special events. But um, what touches my spirit are finding these special compositions that nature just provides all the time if we look. Yeah. Um, your, uh, your comment about taking the first pictures um, and then they came out terrible um, made me laugh because um, it's not an immediate feedback you get on that either at that point in time. The, you know, some of our viewers may not realize that you actually had to send that film out to be developed and, uh, and wait for it to be returned. And, um, so it wasn't the immediate feedback that people get nowadays about their about their pictures. Um, mm. um, when you uh, so these two groups that you're uh, associated with, and and I think that you helped to facilitate the yes. two photography groups. I call it. <laughs> can you? Um, well, I know that 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 was um, you know not in action during COVID. So can you talk about the? The, um, uh, the time since uh, you've been able to get together again and, um, and what, that, um, what the group part of that uh, means to you. Well, we never really stopped. We just ended up going from in-person meetings to Zoom meetings. Um, the, a local library uh, allows us to use their Zoom license, I guess you'd say. Uh, for our, our monthly meetings. And um, then um, one of the other photographers in the other group has a professional Zoom license and so we can use his. So we, we have figured out uh, how using the share screen feature, which is just wonderful. I, I think Zoom has really been such a, a huge benefit to us and being able to continue to meet, to share our images and to talk about them and, and really just um, enjoy each other's company and updates. Because we often don't just talk about our photographs. If somebody has a photograph of their cat, we get a story too. So <laughs> it, it's been um, a way to connect with people that uh, was missing during COVID. Yeah. Um, would you be able to, I, we have a screen sharing ability here. Is it possible for you to share a few of your, of your photographs and uh, tell us a little bit, like you said, there are stories that go along with the photographs, um, um, always, sure. so a little bit about. Sure. Um, let me just get that uh, going here. So um, one of the things, can you see the screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really enjoy is photographing wildlife. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a warbler. I forget the Latin or even official name of it, but um, this is the kind of thing that I really enjoy finding in nature. And, uh, you know, this was an early morning picture. 
um, at Monhegan Island in Maine, which is a uh, like an artist colony, just really an amazing place. Um, and I've got a, a lot of bird photos from there. Birders go there, especially around Memorial Day when the birds are coming back. And uh, the last time I was there, the birders counted 92 different species. Uh, wow. in a, and yeah. Wow. Th well, this that, is, that warbler looked like it might be warbling as you know, yes, snapped I, the picture. Yeah. This is the my Amherst beaver. I, I like, sometimes it seems the animals pose for you. They probably just wonder what the heck you're doing pointing this thing at them. But this is what I enjoy is this kind of opportunity here. And um, looking not just for the big things, but the little things, you know, like these dragonflies. And Stuff. This is in my neighbor's backyard. Mm. Their stats were boot in the winter. Mm. And then this is from the, the Smith Botanical Garden, where I've been a volunteer. They have such an amazing collection, over 4,000 plants from around the world. And um, I really enjoy uh, going there with my camera. This is in the Botanic Garden also. This is a, a damselfly, which is about maybe three quarters of an inch long. And they are usually along the edges, like the uh, dragonflies along the edge of water. Yeah. Um, so this was very unusual. I have never seen a damselfly land on a flower like this. So it was kind of a, a, one of those discovery experiences that uh, gives you the positive feedback you were mentioning before. Yeah. Yeah. And then there are the funny pictures. I took this just two weeks ago. Of a great, <laughs> the a great one. <laughs> my my <laughs> sister saw this and she wants me to entitle it. I have to pee. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So, so there is humor in nature. Oh, yeah. And this this is uh, down at my sister's place. I enjoy again, the birds and especially moments like this where they really display uh, how beautiful they are. And this- And she lives in Connecticut. Yeah, she's down in Connecticut, has a place at the shore. This is a green heron doing a mating dance. Um, very unusual opportunity um, to ca capture this. Um, if you saw it without the feathers ruffled and all looking kind of scraggly, you, you'd wonder if it was the same bird. Very interesting. And of course, they have an amazing pattern on their wings. Mm -hmm. And this, so early morning and late evening are like the best times to go out, which is what I do, get stuff like this. And then I occasionally enjoy with digital photography using Photoshop to blend. This is a, an orchid that, uh, I bought it stop and shop. It's in my living room and actually is blooming again right now. And I just blended it with a, a plant. I need to learn the name of that plant because I want to be able to tell people. But it's, it's a plant with just a lot of leaves like the ones you see here. So you took pictures of the plant and then super in- Yeah, there are two photos, photos that were blended together in Photoshop, mm -hmm. yeah. That's um, really interesting. And th this is funny because this- <laughs> Well, it's, it's an interesting story. The, the merganser duck came up with the crayfish on its beak and ate crayfish. And the next picture I took, the crayfish was in its beak and it was having a meal at breakfast. But it was funny to see it on top of its beak. I expect that the duck went down and lifted its head up from the mud and there it was. <laughs> But they look these like are the, they're looking eye in eye, don't they? Yes, they do. And I'm pretty sure the crayfish is uh, wondering what's going on. Already, some of these look like they could be parts of amazing children's books. You know, uh, like this one could be uh, well, I, the, yeah. story, the story of the duck who, who yeah. talked the um, uh, crayfish into letting him take him across the river. <laughs> yes. I, I thought we could title this one, Thanks for the Ride or something. <laughs> like 
And then there's the small things that are have patterns. I love finding patterns and designs in nature and, and trying to capture those like this. And there's just milkweed seeds, of course. And then the wonderful shapes that you can find at the ocean or fall scenes. This is the Mill River here in Northampton. And then there's, you know, the birds. This is an osprey with a fish that it caught. And oh my, look at that. So, and these baby owls are living in a pine tree in the cemetery where my sister lives. Mm. Um, and, and what kind of owls are they? What they're are great they? horned owls, yeah. which, you know, are the largest ones. And obviously these are babies and they don't look much like their parents, except for the eyes and the beak. Yeah. 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 And, you know, you've also got them in, in a pattern of. Um, oh. Well, that's that's the composition provided by nature that I look for. Um, and it's it's one of the, the challenges and joys of doing nature photography is to find out how to get your subject in the best possible space um, to show it off so people can appreciate it, enjoy it. Mm. Well, I won't go through too many more. Another owl. Mm. I, their eyes are just amazing, of course. Mm. And oh, I, I don't know if I told you about this one. This is, I took just again a couple of weeks ago when the geese here had their babies. And here's the car coming down the road and the baby's in the road. So one of the parents is clearly trying to protect the baby. Mm. So it's, it's fun for me to discover things like that and to be able to capture them. Uh, I used to say on film, but I guess now I need to say on, on the pixels. <laughs> <laughs> and I love photographing beautiful flowers. This is a peony in one of my neighbor's yards. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things I take are local, things that I find as I walk around. They're, they're not the kind of massive landscapes that um, many other photographers are capture and are able to share but anyway that that's enough I think or maybe the oh yeah that, that's not that rabbit's not eating grass it, it's a mom collecting material for the nest right after I took the picture she ran in that grass back there and I guess went into the burrow and prepared the nest so those are the stories that go with some of these pictures and this is an, another picture from Northampton and it one of the things about nature photography is you never know. I was coming home from work one night and I looked in my rear view mirror and this is what I saw. So I pulled a car over to the side of the road and took the picture. You just never know. I mean, nature is um, surprising, wonderfully surprising in many ways. So anyway, that's, that's that. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Well, that was wonderful, Marty. And it gives such a... Uh, a a good example of the kind of eye you have and uh, and the kind of way you may have started by saying your your photographs in that first role were um, pretty terrible, but you obviously have the um, uh, ability to really discover what makes a, a, a photograph come alive and, and be um, of interest, um, what makes it unique and um, of, and also of how you bring, you know, what you see and your spirit to the photograph as well. Um, your being comes through because of what you hone in on. Mm. So I, I thank you so much for sharing those. Oh, you're welcome. So we, um, uh, we are coming toward the end, but I also wanted to um, just say that one of the other ways that um, that I am, have always been inspired by you, Marty, is that you're a father and, um, and you have two children and, um, and there are always ways in which you keep them in mind and, um, and obviously you know, love them and care deeply for them. So I don't know if you want to say anything about, about um, fatherhood well, and what that's meant to you. Well, both of my children have Fragile X syndrome, which is in the autism spectrum of neurological disorders, but they're both wonderful kids uh, and I do love them and still care 
you know, I'm part of their lives. <clears throat> and uh, I, I feel fortunate. Um, both are kind in their hearts. And um, so even though they don't have the ability to express themselves in the ways many other children would, um, I've learned to notice, you know, the things that maybe are not said. And um, so it's, it's been a wonderful uh, learning experience to come to be able to accept them just as they are, which I didn't always do. Um, but I really enjoy their company now. It makes a huge difference when you come to accept people just as they are. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. So, thank Marty, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. For the Inspired Living podcast with Ellen Broderick, my guest today has been Marty Espinola. Thank you so much and see you next week.